This is Pet Life Radio. Let's talk pets. Welcome to Covered in Pet Hair, a boozy show for pet lovers on Pet Life Radio. I'm your host, Isabel alvarez Arana, and today I have the pleasure of launching, kicking off, and starting off Season 3 of Covered in Pet Hair with a gentleman that I have nicknamed the Graham Norton of the pet industry. I will tell you all about him and introduce you as soon as we come back from these messages from our sponsors. Take a bite out of your competition. Advertise your business with an ad in Pet Life Radio podcasts and radio shows. There is no other pet-related media that is as large and reaches more pet parents and pet lovers than Pet Life Radio. With over 7 million monthly listeners, Pet Life Radio podcasts are available on all major podcast platforms. And our live radio stream goes out to over 250 million subscribers on iHeartRadio, Odyssey, TuneIn, Stitcher, and other streaming apps. For more information on how you can advertise on the number one pet podcast and radio network, visit PetLifeRadio.com slash advertise today. Let's Talk Pets on PetLifeRadio.com. Covered in pet hair. I'm your host, Isabel Alvarez Arada, and today I have the pleasure of having a drink and a chat with a pet parent, a dog trainer, a behavior consultant. He's a professional dog walker and pet sitter, a published author, an entrepreneur. He's a pet business coach and mentor, an adventure seeker, a road tripper, and a rescue dog advocate. He's a foodie. He's simultaneously a wine snob and a craft beer guru. He's a tea drinker, a book reader, a podcaster, and a public speaker. He's a cyclist who is originally from Sunderland in the northeast of England, which I'm sure he pronounces very differently. He is husband to Beth, dad to two sons, Alex and Toby. He's dog dad to Sid the Cocker Spaniel and Derek, a rescued dog to Bordeaux. He is the pet biz whiz, author of How to Be Your Dog Superhero and owner of pack leader dog adventures his name is dominic hodgson and he's joining us all the way from the uk welcome dom it's so good to have you on the show so good to be here isabel my face is beaming after that (laughs) wonderful introduction (laughs) by far the best introduction i've ever had on a podcast on stage anywhere i like to talk about everybody's accomplishments even if it's just knowing about craft beers (laughs) <laughs> right. Yeah, well, you know, I, I mean, I don't feel like I have that many strings to my bow, so I like to show them all off when I can. <laughs> well, I am thrilled that we can talk about all of your accomplishments today. I was a guest on your show recently. It was such an honor to be interviewed by the Graham Norton of the pet industry. You are such a good interviewer. I'm going to get into that. But before I do, I want to introduce our drinking game today for our audience. So audience, anytime you hear this word, the secret word is Disney make sure you take a drink of whatever you're enjoying, but please be sure you're over 21 to partake in the US, 18 in the UK. Is that right? Correct. 18 in the UK, never drink and drive no matter where you are and always drink responsibly. So what are you having tonight, Dom? I am having a craft beer, even though I'm a bit of a wine snob. It is it's a tad too early in the day. It's 5 p.m. UK time. So I went for a nice, cool, refreshing craft beer. Can I name it? Yes, of course. Please do. It is a Brixton Brewery Pale Ale. So I first got into pale ales, actually, uh, when I visited the States, when I went to California and I, that I, was, I had a few there and that was it. I was hooked. Oh my goodness. I love it. So you know what? It's nice to travel and try local beers. I feel like that's not everybody has wine, right? Not everybody produces wine. So, but beer, you can find breweries, especially nowadays, almost everywhere. And it's a nice way to kind of get in touch with the local, I guess, culture and what they like, what they have in El Paso here. We have a lot of like mango beers. We have like spicy beers because of the Mexican culture. So Mm. it's nice to do that. So that I don't usually drink beer, but if I travel, I'm having a beer. Absolutely. No doubt about it. I, I totally agree. Yeah. 
Well, today I'm actually, because it's 5 p.m. your time, it's 10 a.m. my time. I'm having a Bellini, a peach Bellini, oh, classic, 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 classic. I like to celebrate with bubbly always. And because we're kicking off season three, I just want to propose a toast to you for helping me do that with such enthusiasm. Cheers. Ching. <laughs> Cha ching. <laughs> Mm. All mm-hmm. right. Well, I always start this show with a game and this season is not going to be an exception. We might even play more games this season if I get inspired to come up with them. But the first game we're playing is actually something I'm thinking of introducing as like kind of a regular recurring segment. See this little ball here? Mm, I'm intrigued. This is what I've called a booze ball. And I'm going to ask you questions from this ball. This ball has little questions. It's made by answers in motion llc i got this in my buy nothing group and i was like when somebody posted i was like this is perfect for my show and she was like it's yours come and get it so i'm going to toss it i'm gonna see where my thumb lands and i'm gonna ask you that question if it's too revealing or you don't feel like tackling that subject you just take a swig of your drink are you ready to play i'm ready i'm ready all right let's see how well i do this let's see how well i do this (laughs) <laughs> All right. What is an important turning point in your life? Wow. I guess, obviously, I'm a father to two kids. I married my childhood sweetheart. So that was a, a, a big moment. But I'm going to say um, when we adopted our first rescue dog, because that ultimately kicked off my passion for help and rescues, which led to the idea for my first dog walking business. And then everything that's kind of happened after that, really. So in a similar way to, you know, you hear Walt Disney say it all started with a mouse. With me, it all started with a dog. I love that answer because I can totally relate to that. All right. So next one. How did you spend your time after school? Well, I was, I've just, when you were reading out my list of accomplishments <laughs> in the introduction, I forgot to mention on my blurb when I was telling you all about, I'm a big musicals fan. So I really love musicals. And when I was a young, when I was a young boy from about the age of 10, like that was kind of all I ever wanted to do. So I was like singing and dancing and taking part in local amateur dramatics and all this kind of thing. And, and then I actually met Beth because I worked, uh, when I was at Performance College, I worked at the local theater, selling ice creams and popcorn and um, programs. And I met Beth there because I just just wanted to be in a theater all the time. And so, yeah, so that was what I used to do after school. I used to just dream of of being in musicals. I love it. No wonder you're a performer and you're a public (laughs) speaker because you've tied both of your passions, speaking to an audience, performing and inspiring and motivating and pets. I love it. All right, last one, last one. Let me toss it again and see if I get a good one. Ooh, a time you got in trouble at school. A time I got in trouble. Oh goodness, there's a few times there was. A, oh. I actually got. I actually, we actually got sent to the headmaster's office. Believe it or not, on our first day, I went to nursery with my best friend, and then we went to school together when we were like five. You know, I'm talking primary school, the first day at school. And at the end of the day, the teacher asked us to put the chairs away. And we were both kind of so keen to help that we ended up fighting over the last chair. And I don't know if she was just <laughs> setting an example, but we both got sent to the headmaster. And uh, yeah, so that was, that kind of set the tone for my education. Maybe. Wow. Just too eager, too eager always. Too eager, I just too, too helpful. That's me all over. Isn't it? <laughs> It sounds just like my son, actually, who is probably going to get himself into trouble for shoving somebody out of the way so he can help. Yes, that is totally my son. If my life's any um, any example, it'll all work out okay. I always say he's either going to be an attorney or he's going to need one. And that is fine (laughs) by me. Like, let us let him be who he is. I will guide him as best I can. All right. So I want to know how long you've been in the pet industry and what inspired you to even get into it. You alluded to your dog, but what were you doing at the time when you adopted that dog? So at the time I was a sales rep, a sales representative for a tobacco company in the UK. And that which just involved me essentially going around local um, shops and off licenses and small superstores and uh, making sure that they were topped up with the correct brands. Really boring. Actually, it was a really well paid job and a good pension, good benefits. Everything was all fine. I'd been doing that for about 10 years and I didn't really 
want to do it for another 30. So I was starting to think about some sort of a change. At the same time as that, I had recently started helping out with my local rescue, just walking the dogs who were awaiting uh, adoption. I wanted to do something like that to because I had spare time on my hands and I'm not very good at golf and I didn't have any other hobbies. <laughs> so I thought I'll, I'll do that and I'll give something back to uh, these rescue sort of community who have given us these wonderful dogs that we had at the time. And that was where the idea started for me thinking, I wonder if there's a, a need for a kind of a more enhanced exercise service for busy pet owners. Because I used to, with the rescue dogs, some of them were a bit a bit wild, you know, and a bit frisky. And, and I used to sort of walk really fast with them to wear them out. And I used to jog with them a little bit as well, you know. And that got me the idea of thinking, oh, if we could provide some sort of an enhanced experience, you know, more exercise, high tempo games, that kind of thing, um, maybe this would go well. So that was kind of the seed for what became in 2011 pack leader dog adventures that is amazing and where exactly are you is your business located in the uk so it is located in sunderland so i was born okay. here um we're still here now um i actually moved five years ago we moved back to the the same village where i grew up <laughs> um and in sunderland it's kind of like i said northeast of england people might be familiar more familiar with newcastle that's kind of just near where we are as well and uh yeah and this is that that's where the business has been the local part of the business has been for 11 years now 12 years Awesome. Well, I have nicknamed you the Graham Norton of the pet industry. And for those who are listening or watching and don't know who Graham Norton is, Graham Norton is a late night TV host in the UK who interviews stars. And he is a fantastic interviewer. He kind of has the same look as you, except he wears <laughs> much more kind of Liberace inspired clothing. Cause I mean, and he likes, he likes to drink does Graham as well. He does like to drink. And I, you know, I love that show. So you have put out in between two, podcasts you have put out over 300 episodes so tell me how did you get into podcasting and when so i started pack leader dog adventures it was slow to start but then it really busied up when the business was full i launched an online store which didn't do very well i started to do events i basically got the business bug and uh, like an entrepreneurial bug and i wanted to try lots of different things and through trial and error I kind of arrived at originally was a, an online dog training program and I wrote my first book and I was thinking, how can I promote this better? And I had all these wonderfully well-trained dogs that we were walking every day and we have beautiful scenery here. And I, like you said, I kind of must have had a an untapped, you know, release for the performance side of my personality. And so I, I was always pretty confident on videos and, and all this kind of thing. And I thought, why don't we just do a podcast? You know, they were just kind of taken off then. So the first time we did a video podcast, yeah, that ran for about 55 episodes. And then we switched to an audio podcast for the pet business stuff after that. And yeah, I absolutely love it. You know, I, I love getting interviewed by amazing interviews like yourself. And I love interviewing too. It's a great way to learn, isn't it? And just, you know, have fun. I love your podcast because it's really like a tell me your childhood. Tell me like you're the Graham Norton, but also the Oprah. Like, tell me more about yourself. And how did that make you feel? I felt I felt like you truly wanted to know my whole life story. I loved sharing that with you. You're a great interviewer. You kind of listen really well. So I props to you. I think your podcast is awesome. For those that aren't familiar with it, it's called the Poodle to Pitbull podcast, right? That's correct. Poodle to Pitbull pet business podcast. That's right. Yeah. And I love that your intro says, like, not for scaredy cat business owners. Here we talk to the people who are ready to take things to the next level. If you are a pet business owner, you need to listen to this podcast, especially the one that I'm on, of course. But OK, so you wear a ton of hats in the pet industry, podcaster, business owner, business coach and mentor, dog trainer, dog walker, which is your favorite? I did an interview with um, a guy who is a like a mindset coach a number of years ago. And he told a story about how he once helped a, a swimmer, like a, sw a Commonwealth Games swimmer to focus. The guy was losing focus. And basically the, the big thing that he taught him was, he said, all you need to do is he was, this swimmer was thinking about the sponsorship and all these different things. And he couldn't concentrate on the swimming. And the, the coach said, all you need to concentrate on is your two lengths of the pool. You know, all you've got to think about is swimming from here to there and then back again. That's all you need to think about. You don't worry about anything else. And that really resonated with me. And I was, it took me a while to identify what my kind of two lengths of the pool were. Mm. And I did. And I, uh, so really for me, it's, it's like marketing. I love marketing. I consider this marketing, you know, cause I'm speaking right. and promoting, uh, coaching. 
I love coaching, so satisfying, helping people to turn around their businesses, you know, release their passion and um, make more money. Um, and writing, I love writing as well. So I, I'm in a very fortunate position at the moment where my working week consists of doing those three things all the time. That is awesome. I will agree with you. I love marketing and I love writing. I actually am a freelance writer for publications, both in print and online, but I tried my hand at coaching and I was very frustrated because I'm such a doer and I have such a hard time watching people stand in their own way. So I have to applaud you because it takes a special person to kind of kind of motivate, even though you're watching people not, not motivate themselves. Hmm. Absolutely. And I think, well, on you, first of all, you know, this should be something you might want to think about again, because you have so much knowledge and experience to share. That certainly came out on the podcast interview you did with me. Thank you. But I think my style, you talked about it, you know, the introduction to the podcast, you know, I'm very no fluff, no BS, you know, there's no, <laughs> I call a spade a spade, you know, or an effing spade. And like this, you know, we got to, <laughs> we got to be, I'm, I try to, it was the same when I was doing dog training, you know, kind of not trying to use long, complicated dog trainer language that people don't understand. And same with the coaching. You know, I think if you're straight with people and you uh, you help them to identify where they are and where they want to go and then you show them the pathway, then, you know, nine times out of 10, they go for it. But you're dead right. We get in our way more than any other, you know, barrier that we might perceive to be in our way. Yes. We're, the, we're the bottleneck most of the time. Absolutely. And I love your no BS approach to this whole industry and life. I need to take a break right now. But when we get back, I want you to tell me with no BS the differences in pet parenting when it comes to UK pet parents versus American pet parents. So stay tuned. I'll be right back with Dom Hodgson. Molly, here's your dinner. <laughs> Zeus, that's not your food. Don't let that happen to your precious cat. Elevate your cat's eating experience with the Cat Tree Tray. The Cat Tree Tray keeps your cat's food off the floor and conveniently located on the cat tree. It's the perfect way to eat. It's a beautiful wrought iron tray that easily attaches to your cat tree and keeps dogs and other critters out of your cat's dish. A must for multi-pet households. There's a 6-inch tray for large bowls and a 4-inch tray for smaller bowls. Purchase your Cat Tree Tray today. Go right now to CatTreeTray.com. That's CatTreeTray.com. C-A-T-T-R-E-E-T-R-A-Y.com. Let's talk pets. Let's talk pets. On Pet Life Radio. Pet Life Radio. PetLifeRadio.com. <laughs> Welcome back to Covered in Pet Hair. I'm your host, Isabel alvarez Rada, and I am here with Dom Hodgson, who is a business coach, business owner, the Graham Norton of the pet industry. And he is going to play a game with me now that I call Neither Here Nor There. So what this game consists of, uh, Dominic, is I'm going to give you some trivia. It could be about the UK, it could be about the US, or it could be about neither. I want you to guess. The first one is super easy. So, and the second one I think is quite easy. It gets a little hairier after that. Are you ready to play? I'm ready. I'm ready. I hope I pronounced this word right. Worcestershire sauce was invented here. Here as in the States or in? In this place. Is it the oh, UK? Is it Worcester the yes, USA? Correct. Or correct. is it neither? Worcester sauce. Correct. Where is it? Which UK. one? The UK. That's right. Okay. So how do you pronounce that word? Worcester sauce. Worcester sauce. We call it Worcestershire. Worcest what? I don't even know what we say anymore because I like overthought this. Worcestershire. We call it Worcestershire <laughs> sauce. <laughs> okay, next one. The best selling book series in the world was penned here. So you have to tell me what was it the UK? Is it the US or is it neither? Best selling book series. I'll say here. UK. Mm -hmm. Harry the Potter? Harry Potter series. Wow. Exactly. Very good. All right. This I've got my Harry Potter wand in the background. Can you see? Oh, do you? Look at that. My, my Nimbus 2000. <laughs> <laughs> I need a Nimbus 2000. <laughs> All right. This country is the world's largest exporter of pecans. I'm going to say US. Oh, it is actually, ne no, neither. Is it, it is neither. Oh, it's Mexico. It's Mexico. Darn. Mexico actually puts out 
2% of the world's pecans. And how do you pronounce pecans? Pecan. Pecans. So when I lived Pecan in France, pie. yes, when I lived in France after college, my best friend there was uh, from the UK. She's a, a Londoner and she and I were celebrating Thanksgiving, which I know you all don't do, but she wanted to do something traditional with me since I was there away from my family. And she got peak and pie and she was telling me about peak and pie. And I had no idea what she was talking about until I saw pecan pie on her table. And then I was like, oh yes, of course I know what this is, but here it's either Pecan or pecan. Wow. Wow. There yeah. we, I did not know that. There we go. All right. So now we got to move forward. This country consumes the most beer per capita. I'm going to say a, it's a good one. Could it be? I'm going to go UK. It's neither. It's the Czech Republic. Wow. Good for them. I know. It's interesting. <laughs> I mean, you got to feel bad for them a little bit now. But yeah, <laughs> I mean, so long as their beer stays there. Uh, this country has the most dogs per capita. UK? The US. Oh, wow. According to quotationcheck.com, and whenever I find these things, I like to quote the website so I don't get in trouble. Like, take it up with the website if they're wrong. 274 dogs for every 1,000 people in the US. Wow. wow, wow. That's a lot. Almost a third, what isn't is, it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. All right. This country is known for having the oldest residents still in use. US. UK, Windsor Castle. Uh, oh, of course, stay me. That should have oh. been terrible. All right, the last one. This country is the world's fourth largest country by total area. US. That is right, the, the US. All right, so the only reason I wanted to play this game is because I want to talk about the differences that you, as somebody who's worked with pet parents in the UK, pet sitters, pet pros in the UK versus here in the US, because I know you do come over here for speaking engagements and you do have coaching clients here in the US. What is the biggest thing that American pet parents can learn from UK pet parents? Wow. I think in the States, the thing about it is everything that happens, almost everything that happens in the States ends up coming over here anyway, you know? So right. the whole, you know, treating the dogs as fur babies and, and treating them as, um, you know, extended members of the family and almost treating the dog better than you would treat other members of your human side of your family, you know, <laughs> I, I, I would say this, th this is happening. Obviously it's happens a lot in the States. It, it's a big part of the culture happening a lot here too, you know? So it's it definitely happening more and more here, but not, not quite as much probably as what it happens in the States. I would probably say it within the UK, there's probably, again, don't quote me on this, but I'll probably, there's, there's probably a large, large percentage of people in the UK than in the U S who kind of treat their dogs more like dogs, you know, more like the traditional sense of a, a dog. Do you think that's a good thing? I mean, in some senses, it kind of can be, right? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, the best thing you can do for a dog in many ways is treat it like a dog. You know, if you give it everything that a dog needs, like from a puppy, then he'll more than likely develop into a fantastic, easy to look after dog, you know, and that's right. kind of what I taught in How to Be a Dog Superhero and the other books that I've written and stuff and was part of the doctrine that I was doing is trying to make that what can we do to make sure that this dog that you've got is like as easy as possible to look after, you know, right. yeah, you're going to love him, he's going to add loads of things to your life, you know, you're going to spend time together, everything else, but, you know, Whilst your dog might be your whole life, you do have other aspects of your life as well. You've got to go to work. You've got to take your kids yep. here, there and everywhere. You know, you're going to go on holiday. So let's teach the dog to be easy to exercise. Let's teach him to be okay on his own. You know, let's teach him mm -hmm. not to go crazy when he sees other dogs or squirrels or pheasants or pigeons or whatever. Right. You know, this type of thing. So treat, treating him more um, like raising him more like a like a dog. Like the dog you want to spend like your the dog time you want. with. Yeah, yes, yeah. And this is exactly. not, you know, I'm not saying like, you know, a dog, we don't care about him or anything else. Right. Like, you yeah, know, yeah, more yeah. like a, just a, his role. What's his, his pet dog? You know, what's his role in the family? You know, let's, let's raise him to be like a really easy to look after, well-balanced, fun pet dog. And how about travel? Do do people in the UK travel with their pets more because of like the rail system? Does it make it easier? Do you find that UK dogs travel better than American dogs? Yeah, it's interesting. I think if they've been raised to travel, then it's much easier. I just did an interesting project recently. Uh, a client of ours who we looked after her dogs for about five or six years, she moved to Portugal uh, about four years ago. And uh, she wanted another dog. She wanted a puppy. So she contacted us. So to cut long story short, we collected the puppy for her from the breeders. We raised him for five weeks. And then me and Toby, my youngest son, who's 18, 
we traveled with him over to Portugal. We took him over there. You know, we drove down, we got the ferry, we drove through Spain down into Portugal and we hand over, we stayed for a couple of days and saw them and it was fantastic. The whole thing went wonderfully well, but we raised the puppy to be easy to travel because I knew he was going to go on a boat because I knew he was going to spend three days in a car. Now we took him everywhere. You know, we took him everywhere right. from the very first day that we got him. He went with us on car trips. He was in and out the car more times than I don't know what, you know, he was. Um, so we raised him for that. And on that journey, we, I did, we did see a lot of people with dogs on the ferry and they were really well behaved really calm really settled really just used to the traveling yeah and you do see them on trains you know as well my sister lives in spain and her dog i actually found in louisiana in the middle of the street and he eventually moved to spain and now he's crossed wow. the atlantic like 10 times he's he's wow. like such a world traveler but my sister you know yeah it's like she's a single woman who a professional woman who likes to travel and she's a teacher so she gets summers off and comes back to the u.s for extended stays and her dog has learned to live that lifestyle it may not be his preference to sit on a plane for eight hours or 10 hours however long you know the miami madrid flight is but he does it and he and he's you know he does it well so i agree you know it's kind of like when you need to do it you just do it and your dog kind of responds so you as a as the pet biz whiz have taken on this kind of new project or like new love of disneyfying businesses i know you're inspired by disney i know you're going to do a visit in disney soon and you're doing a speaking engagement while you're there in orlando tell me about what a disneyfied business looks like okay well there's three there's three little elements i'll share three of the elements anyway now if that's okay and then you hopefully yeah That'll give you a bit of a taster for it. Disney's obviously, they're master storytellers, aren't they? You know, the storytelling for Disney is everything, not just in the, the animated movies and the movies that they, they produce, but also in the, the parks as well, you know, and on the rides. They want to tell a story. They want people to feel something when, you know, there has to be a start and a beginning and an end to all of the experiences they create. We can do a similar thing with that with your with our pet businesses as well. You know, we want to and we should really be creating an experience for the client that is enhanced and it is, you know, it has surprises in there and, and you know, pe people feel valued and they feel special because what this does is this contributes to the storytelling that they do about your business, you know, and all of these extra things that you do in your business with your onboarding and the extra attention that you lavish upon the dogs and you communicate that to the clients, this results in a, the clients telling great stories about your business. You know, you'll never guess what my dog walker did today, or you'll never guess what my dog groomer gave me today, or you'll never guess how my dog doggy daycare, what event they did, you know, and there's, I can give you hundreds of examples of ways that clients of mine have disney the business, you know, by dressing up with the dogs for the walks or putting on special themed training sessions. And I've got guys who do in their daycares, you know, they have special Harry Potter weeks that we just talked about. And, you know, it's all themed by that. So it, it creates, you're creating stories around the business and this helps you to grow your reputation and helps you stand out from the competition as well. So that's the first one. Okay. Nice. Nice. All right. Well, how about Okay, so I was in London ages ago with my London friends and my cousin who went to Cambridge, who's not from London, but we met there and we were talking about customer service and customer service in the UK is very different than customer service in the US, particularly like in restaurants. My friends who were present were telling me that they felt like in the US when you go to a restaurant and somebody's like, hi, my name is Isabel and I'll be your server and they're all peppy and happy that it was BS that they weren't buying it because it was just like just like it, this American jolly old front. Right. Does that kind of happen also in the pet industry where people are like, I mean, it's like just walk my dog. I think maybe it is, but thinking about what we talked about before, but there'll be some clients who will think that, you know, and I'll, I'll say for, from my point of view, I never thought it was, well, I, I knew it was part of the sales charm, the sales patter of the server or the greeter in the store, but I, I was impressed by it still, you know, it, okay. it, kind of, it, it warmed me as I walked in. I much prefer that to what happens over here, you know, <laughs> where you get zero, I, I, seriously, I, you get zero, pretty much zero customer service over here. So I way prefer the way that you guys do it over there. But 
I think that if you think about what we talked about before, about how pet owners now, you know, they, they're babyfying their dogs and they, they want this extra thing. You know, it's not like we're selling them even, you know, like dog food or dog beds or right. apparel. This is the dog that will right. certainly the guys that I look after, the service based pet business owners, you know, the, the, these are the guys who I coach. So this service, you know, for what is essentially the dog owner's most precious thing in the world. I don't think you can go too far with, you know, Disneyfying and creating a, a fantastic experience that causes the client to feel really good about about what they're in, what their dogs enjoy. It's so funny you should say that. I do think that the pet industry lends itself, especially the service industry aspect of the pet industry. When my kid started school, and it's a private school, and it was one of the you know better schools here. I was actually kind of disappointed because I was expecting to have the same kind of like communication that I had gotten from my pet sitters in the past, you know, like I didn't get an update on day one and my three and a half year old was there. I didn't really get much feedback at all. But when my dogs are taken care of by any pet sitter we've ever had across multiple areas, I get a text with a picture saying how happy they are. And so I was actually expecting more from school because I'm spoiled by my pet sitters. So I agree, like the, the industry just lends itself to that. It's pets, it's fun. The technology allows for it. Um, so tell us how my audience can learn more about you and your coaching so that they too can Disneyfy their business. Cool. So yeah, I have uh, the podcast, obviously. They can check out the podcast, the Poodle to Pitbull Pet Business Podcast. You can go to petbusinessmarketing.com to find out more about me and the coaching service that I offer. Like you said, we have clients in the US and Australia and everywhere. The new Disneyfy book um, will be available at petbusinessmarketing.com forward slash magic book. Or you can look for how to Disneyfy your pet business on Amazon or anywhere else that, um, that people want to buy a book, basically. That is awesome. Well, I just want to propose a toast to you for being so awesome and for being my guest. Thank you so much for helping me kick off season three. Thank you so much, Isabel. You've been a, a wonderful, gracious host, and as I knew you would be, and uh, I, I thoroughly enjoyed myself. So thank you very much. Likewise, truly always great to catch up with you. And I also want to propose a toast to our executive producer, Mark Winter. Thank you, Mark. And to our audience for joining us. Here's to a life covered in pet hair because there's no better way to live. Cheers. Cheers. To learn more about Covered in Pet Hair, please visit CoveredInPetHair.com or PetLifeRadio.com. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time. Let's Talk Pets, every week on demand, only on PetLifeRadio.com.